Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, when I got the uh, letter inviting me to the conference, I was very, very excited. I had come to the Senate after Howard Baker had left, but just after he had left, two years later. And I, he, his imprint was so huge, and I was so excited. And I'd always, always admired him, as did my, um, my boss, Senator Moynihan, was a big fan of Howard Baker's. So I wanted to tell you that one of the reasons that I was so excited was that Many years later, after I had um, completed my PhD, I was finishing my PhD at the Brookings Institution on a fellowship, and in um, 1993, and this should just, for the students, I want to give you a little bit of context about money, President Clinton, who had a unified Democratic House and Senate, the Democrats controlled the House and Senate, President Clinton said, we're still in a slight recession, I'd like to spend a little money on the stimulus package. How about $19 billion? That's all he wanted, $19 billion. Do you guys know, anybody know how much the stimulus package was? Any students know how much we spent or we're about to spend? $787 billion. All Clinton wanted was $19 billion. And there were four people who blocked him, all Democrats. Um, I'm just going to mention two in particular, well, the three Bs, like three people. Senator Bryan of Nevada, Senator Bro of Louisiana, Senator Boren. And they went to the floor of the Senate, and they filibustered the stimulus package. Um, Senator Byrd was the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and Senator Mitchell was the majority leader. And this is something that Howard Baker probably would never have done, but what Mitchell did do was step aside and let Robert Byrd manage the bill. In other words, when you go to the floor of the Senate, there's a senator who's in charge of managing the legislation, typically the committee chair and the ranking member, who's the highest... Um, the highest serving member on the committee from the opposite party, the minority party. So uh, Senator Byrd stepped aside, uh, Senator Mitchell stepped aside, Senator Byrd ran the Senate, and he did exactly what Steve Roberts talked about. He filled the amendment tree. So it was, and it was an unheard of process at that time. It had happened twice before in the last decade. And what he said was, I think the president's package should pass. You Democrats people, members in his own party, you're threatening to derail an important package, the president needs it, so I'm filling the amendment tree on the stimulus package, which meant literally there are seven opportunities to amend a bill. And I will not bore you with all that, what they're called. But seven opportunities to amend a bill. And uh, what happened was Senator Byrd is the first person to get recognition by the chair of the Senate. And what's fascinating about Senate rules is everybody thinks they're set in stone, that they've been written somewhere, and that this is why things work the way they do. But you guys know majority recognition. In other words, why when you watch C-SPAN, or if you guys ever do, or CNN or Fox, you always see the majority leader speaking. Why? Because the majority leader is given what's called first recognition. There's a standing rule of the Senate that says... Every senator, if they raise their hand and say, Madam President, I rise today, they get recognized to speak. That right to speak is where filibusters come from. That's where the filibuster comes from. It's simply the right to be recognized, to hold the floor and speak. The problem ha occurred for the Senate starting in the 1920s and really moving into the 1930s was that it was getting busy. There were lots of things to do. So if everybody jumped up and got recognized, there wasn't that much that they could get done. So ultimately, in 1937, the presiding officer of the Senate, and for you students, that was the vice president of the United States, up until the 1950s, the person you saw on that screenshot, well, people didn't see that, there was no TV yet, but the person you saw was the vice president of the United States, who's constitutionally the presiding officer of the Senate. And the vice president, up until Richard Nixon was vice president, used to sit in that chair. So the Democrats controlled um, the, the Senate and the, the White House. The vice president was, uh, was a Democrat. And the, a person rose to speak, and it was a very controversial bill. It was an anti-lynching bill. It was a very complicated situation. And the majority leader wanted recognition to finagle things so that there wouldn't be embarrassing votes and they could come to some compromise. But up until then, it had never been clear that the majority leader gets to go first. But in that day, on, on that bill, the, the, the vice president of the United States says the majority leader shall be recognized first, even though another senator, Senator Robert Wagner of New York, put his hand up and said, I'm here first. And the vice president said, no, it has been an informal tradition that we recognize the majority leader. 
So we are going to recognize the majority leader first. In fact, that will be a standing precedent of the Senate. I'm ruling as chair of the Senate. That will be the rule. And it didn't really take hold firmly, firmly until the 1950s under Johnson. But it's a very powerful thing. People don't, people think it was, it's always been this way. In fact, there wasn't even a majority and minority leader of the United States Senate till 1912, officially. Before that, it was somebody who was popular and persuasive and powerful. And they thought, oh, you, you look good, you'll be our leader. And you'll build coalitions and structure votes. But it was nothing, or, you know, you think this is in the Constitution. It's nowhere in the Constitution at all. So they, they get the recognition power, which is an enormous power for the majority leader. And if nobody else is on the floor, the minority leader gets recognized next. But the majority leader, by getting that right of first recognition, which was so important, changed the nature of how the Senate did their business and laid the very small seeds for the partisanship you see today, for the structuring of the amendments that you see today. So filling of the tree, as Steve mentioned, was something that leaders didn't do. Senator Baker, as majority leader, did it once in 1984 just once. Senator Dole as leader from 1985 on and off to 1985 and 86, and then he became leader again in 95 and 96. Senator Dole did it once. Senator Byrd um, decided it was so important that he was going to invoke this very, very controversial procedure. And what he did was he was recognized as the acting majority leader, so he got recognized first. He brought up the committee substitute of the bill, and he proceeded to offer six more amendments because nobody else could get the floor till he had yielded it, and he didn't yield it. Senator Byrd was not a particularly yielding guy, didn't yield the floor. So then, not only shutting out the three conservative Democrats who didn't want to see this money pass, they wanted much smaller amounts, maybe seven or nine billion. He shut out all the Republicans, and this was, this was bad. I mean, you spoke a little bit about the fact that you can't even offer amendments anymore on the floor of the Senate, but in those days, it was considered sacrosanct. You didn't shut people out this way. So immediately, uh, people really started to complain. What's interesting about this is that Senator Phil Graham of Texas rose up and went ballistic, and he had a fascinating colloquy with Byrd about the rights of individual senators, but Senator Dole did not object. He said, this is a little bit unorthodox, a little bit unfair, but I've done it when I thought I needed to do it, so I can't really complain. It completely backfired on Senator Byrd, the use of the amendment tree. I think something Senator Baker would have understood, don't do this, it's not the right time. It backfired so badly because he had angered Democrats in his own party and all the Republicans, and the Republicans didn't want us to pass the stimulus package. It was a perfect opportunity to say, you're not being fair. So they filibustered. So not only did the Democrats say, we're just going to talk this thing to death, the Republicans joined in with them, and there was a recess coming up, and the majority leader refused to reschedule the recess. Mitchell let them go out. When they came back, they decided that they couldn't possibly get the stimulus package passed at all. Senator Byrd had to take down the tree. The bill was withdrawn from the floor, and President Clinton never got his stimulus package. All because of the power of the right of first recognition for the majority leader. And deciding when to use that and when not to use that, that was an enormous set of skills that Howard Baker had when he was minority leader, when to obstruct and when to cooperate, and when he was majority leader. He didn't work with a hammer. He didn't pound people. He tried to persuade and build coalitions. But I'll tell you a story about his tenure, which is that it was successful for a while, but then even he ran into trouble with his own party. So I want to talk a little bit about that example. But getting back to the stimulus package, in April of 1993, after it had failed, President Clinton had lost. It was a big defeat for the president early in his uh, administration. A colleague of mine who had worked with Senator Moynihan, his name is Curtis Kelly, and I loved procedure. So we thought, we're going to write an op-ed about this amendment tree and about Byrd and about the whole, how it all backfired. And Senator Baker beat us to it. He was more prominent, of course. And so the Washington Post ran a great op-ed by Senator Baker on the exact same thing that we had wanted to get published on. So that was kind of sad for us. But we sent him the op-ed. I was at the Brookings Institution at the time, and I actually still have the letter that we sent. And I have, in fact, this is the point of the story, I have um, his letter that he sent back. And I want to tell, especially the young people, about what it means to be to put it simply, a, a class act. I mean, how do you conduct yourself even after you've left 
um, the corridors of, of elected office. So we sent him a letter that said, Senator Baker, you beat us to it. We're big fans of yours, but we want you to read this too because we think maybe you'd enjoy it. So uh, he wrote us back rather promptly, which is also a sign of great leadership skills. And um, I didn't bring the original letter with me, with the original envelope, because I didn't want to lose it, so I have a copy. Um, and he said, I do appreciate your letter of April 27 and the copy of your article about Senator Byrd's parliamentary prowess. I can testify firsthand that you did not overstate his ability in that category. When I became majority leader, I figured the best thing I could do was to try to strike a deal that neither of us would ever intentionally surprise the other, to which he readily agreed. We never did, which made for a great personal relationship. He and I remained very good friends after eight years of opposition as leaders. And he closes with saying, thanks for your remarks about my piece in the Post. That felt like old times. I think it's just a life lesson for students. I always like to give you a life lesson. You know, you can be the most famous, most powerful person in America, but the way you treat people that you don't know that aren't in a position to do you any favors is really the mark of, a, of character. Um, and it was a, we were so excited to get this letter. But I also want to point out, he said he was friends with Bird. I don't think Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell have gone out for a personal dinner on a friendly basis ever. Mitch McConnell's the minority leader and Harry Reid's the majority leader, ever. Dole and Bird went toe-to-toe -to -toe for years and years, but there was always a, a semblance of respect. And I think Professor Roberts is absolutely right. Much of that respect is gone, and it makes it much more difficult to govern the Senate. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, Howard Baker in particular. I'm just not sure how many of um, the students or people in the room know exactly what he did as minority leader and majority leader and what it meant to be a leader in his, in his eyes. So I want to give you two quotes. One is from 1978. Howard Baker of Tennessee is a serious man who knows all the cards in the political deck. I think that's a terrific quote. It's from James Scotty Reston, um, Professor Roberts' mentor. And another quote, the hallmark of his leadership has been fairness and consideration. You can rely on his word. And that was from Senator Orrin Hatch in 1983. And Senator Hatch was not newly elected. He'd been in there. He was finishing his first term in the Senate uh, at the time when he said that. And Orrin Hatch was a Republican from Utah. So I want to really point out that it is not as if it's impossible to achieve the kind of civility that you're talking about. But what leaders have to decide is that it's, it's in their interest to behave in a certain way to get their agendas or their president's agendas passed. In the end of the day, it used to be about rounding up 51 votes. Now it's about rounding up 60 votes because of cloture. And how do you do that? How do you build coalitions? And it's not impossible to get people to cross the aisle, but it's incredibly difficult now. The question is, was it much different when Howard Baker was minority and majority leader? And I want to talk about one, I think, of the uh, greatest hallmarks of his tenure as minority leader in terms of the country. And you mentioned it briefly, but I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, and I want to just outline what does a Senate minority leader do? So if you're watching Mitch McConnell today, what is he supposed to do? What is the job of the minority leader? So a very famous congressional scholar named Robert Peabody outlined five things minority leaders do. They coordinate the uh, minority party. They cooperate with the majority leader on the scheduling of legislation. We're going to talk a little bit about whether that's possible to do today. Implement, modify, and occasionally thwart the programs of the majority party. Occasionally. This was written in 1981. Contribute to policy innovation, and then working to convert his party from a minority to a majority. So the question is, is it really possible to cooperate with the majority leader when you're the minority leader, but still also try to win control of the Senate back? Is it possible really to do those two things? I mean, do we dream that it's possible, or is it politically actually possible? And in this day and age, you can argue it's almost impossible with the nature of partisanship, both in the voting public and also in Congress. So how realistic are those, are those guidelines? What's interesting is that Howard Baker managed, I think, to do a little bit of both. He stepped across the party line very, in a very key maneuver in 1978 on the Panama Canal Treaty. And somebody wrote of him in that, in that effort, and I'm going to describe it in a second. His victory was in displaying that he could do more than oppose. And that's something you want to think about. Do senators today in the minority party actually ever think 
that it might be good for them, even, much less the country, if they did more than oppose. The Panama Canal Treaty was controversial. We had controlled the, the Panama Canal for 70 years, 80 years. It was very controversial. There was a dictator who ran Panama, um, a not particularly nice guy named Omar Torrios. And the question is, why are we giving up this key trade route and control of it to Panama? We've run it forever. Why do we want to give it up? And Republicans, men, a lot of Republicans were against giving it up. Some conservative Southern Democrats as well. So Howard Baker had a choice. He was minority leader. He could say, I'm not supporting this. President Carter wants it. I don't think it's good for the country. My party doesn't really want it. Some members of my party. I can just say, forget it, walk away. Um, or I can see what I can do as a diplomat, as a senator, as somebody who's representing the institution of the Senate, which constitutionally has to ratify treaties. So he had a difficult choice. What he chose to do was be a consummate negotiator and compromiser. He went to Panama. He met with General Torrios. He said, listen, I'm going to make or break this deal for you. you, you we're going to have a conversation, and I'm either going to get a sense you're going to agree to some of my terms, or I'm going to leave, and you're not getting your treaty. So he negotiated with him and said one of the most important things was that U.S. troops could go in at any time. When there was some instability or if the U.S. felt it was important, it wouldn't be an act of war or a sign of invasion. It would be protecting U.S. interests. And as long as that was in, in the documentation of the treaty negotiations, Howard Baker felt he could be somewhat comfortable supporting the treaty. He didn't tell the general that. He just said he'd be more likely to support it. And that, in fact, may get more votes for him in the Senate. You know, you need two-thirds of the Senate to ratify a treaty. So it was a very tall order. You needed all the Democrats plus Republicans. So I did have, um, I highly recommend this because it's, it's also for the young people really interesting to see what television was like in the ancient times, which is 1978 and 1979. ABC News has a terrific archive of a lot of older things. And I do have the website. I'm happy to email it to anybody. And they have a five-minute clip of um, actually Frank, um, he died, Frank Reynolds. Frank Reynolds um, covering the vote in the Senate. But because the Senate wasn't televised yet, they have a, a flat picture of the Senate chamber, but they don't have anything like you see today where you could see people voting. And it's a fabulous five-minute piece, and it talks about the role of Senator Baker and how instrumental he was in getting this treaty passed. So the treaty came in two parts. One was the Pan Panama Canal Treaty. One was the Neutrality Treaty. They both passed a month after Mar March and April by one vote, essentially. Um, in other words, it was 67 votes for. And that by all media accounts at the time, could not have happened without Howard Baker. Minority leader cooperating with the majority leader and the President of the United States, who was an opposite party person. So this is what Adam Clymer wrote in March of 1978 in the New York Times about Howard Baker. Mr. Baker's role with Mr. Byrd in shaping the leadership amendments to the treaties provided a shield for other senators without him as both leader and, a, and as lightning rod, at least five of the 16 of the Republican senators who voted aye on Thursday would almost surely have been in opposition. That's what leadership is. Leadership is saying, I believe there's something better for the country that needs to be done. I'm crossing the aisle. But it's also smart leadership. He crossed the aisle with a good portion of his Republican colleagues. He didn't cross the aisle by himself. That wouldn't have been enough. He needed to not only... Um, cooperate, but bring other Republican senators with him. And that is leadership. And that was crucial for the passage of the treaty. And I think that, I think that in that way, it enhanced his power, actually, in the Republican and Democratic caucuses in the Senate, but it cost him something. Starting in 1978, and this is a very broad macro trend, Starting in the 1978 period, plus 80, plus 82, the South, which had been white, Democrat, conservative, started to move Republican. Slowly, Newt Gingrich was elected in 1978. Trent Lott had been elected, I think, in 1976 to the House. So they, they, it was slowly moving. So what you saw was a very vocal conservative wing of the Republican Party and a conservative wing of the Democratic Party, but a very conservative wing of the, vo of the Republican Party really starting to emerge and laying the groundwork for Ronald Reagan's victory for president in 1980. So Baker started to feel the heat from the right, from the right wing of his party in a considerable way. Now, as um, I'm going to quote Cokie Roberts, uh, 
uh, I think this is her line, every senator when they get up in the morning, they look in the mirror and they think I should be president and I'm going to run. Well, Howard Baker wasn't immune, although I wouldn't say it was as ego-driven as other senators, but he thought maybe I'm going to run for president in 1980. Jimmy Carter looked very vulnerable. I mean, if you could be a president and have every bad piece of luck that you could possibly imagine, you'd be Jimmy Carter. I mean, he made a lot of mistakes as president, but he had, a, he had just a string of external things that happened to him that no president could probably handle. Um, if you think things are bad for Obama, you have nothing. You should go back and read about Jimmy Carter. Everything, every time he'd wake up, he'd get one thing done, and then something horrible in the world would happen to him. So he was very vulnerable, and he was a very thoughtful guy, but he, he was a little tough to negotiate with. I think Senator Baker found him tough to work with. So Senator Baker figured, well, I can be president. I've been around a long time. I'm smart. Um, I have a nice message I think I can send to the, uh, the people of, uh, of the nation. The problem for Senator Baker was that another guy named Ronald Reagan, who had been governor of California and an actor, was running too. And Reagan had run had pretty strong, actually, in 1976. Not quasi, but he, Dole, and Ford sort of competed. He didn't do that well, but he laid the groundwork. So in 1980, Ronald Reagan runs, and then George H.W. Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, also runs. The problem for Baker was that he could distinguish himself from Reagan because Reagan was this new breed of very conservative Republican, but Bush sold himself as a more moderate version. You know, he's either from Texas or Connecticut, depending on what day of the week you ask George Herbert Walker Bush, but his father was a senator from Connecticut, Senator Prescott Bush, and he sold himself as a moderate Yankee Republican um, till he ran in 1988 again. Well, I won't jump ahead. So he ran... And uh, so Reagan runs, Bush runs, and Baker runs. The problem for Baker was that Bush stole some of that vote. If Bush had not been in, it's, it's possible that Baker could have outmaneuvered or done better against Reagan. But in those days, there was an Iowa caucus in January, and this will be amazing to you kids, is that um, the New Hampshire primary wasn't until the second or third week in February. I mean... You know, the Republican nomination was over by the end of February in 2008. But in these days, they were much more spread out, the primaries. So Baker came in third in Iowa and third in New Hampshire. Nobody was giving him any money. Ra Reagan had wrapped up all the California money. Bush had the Eastern established money. There wasn't a lot of money to be raised. He was in debt. He said, you know what, I'm going to go back to the Senate and be minority leader again. I'm going to drop out. So in March, he dropped out of the presidential race. It was the only distraction in Howard Baker's tenure as minority a majority leader. So he comes back to the Senate, and his very good friend, Ted Stevens, the late Senator Ted Stevens of Alaska, had been running the show for him um, and doing a pretty good job. But by the time that happens, 1980, it becomes increasingly apparent that not only might Carter lose, but that there might actually be a possibility of taking the Senate back. You know, the opposite party always thinks there's a chance. But as the year unfolded, there was a bigger chance, a, more likely, a bigger likelihood. And the crop of senators who were running in the Republican Party in 1980 were more conservative than the senators who were serving at the time in the Republican Party. So Baker looks around and thinks, we're, we're going to try to get the Senate back. We're going to try to elect as many Republicans as we can. Again, he didn't cross the line on campaigning. But it, it really reduced the amount of flexibility he had in negotiating with Byrd in cooperating publicly with the Democrats. As the stakes got higher and it really appeared the Republicans were going to make good gains and could, keep the sen could take the Senate back from the Democrats, he had to pull back in his public role of negotiating with the Democrats and really articulate the Republican line. The Republican Party line in 1980 was not the same Republican Party line that he had always known. It was much more rigid about um, less federal government, much more rigid about tax cuts, and much stronger on defense than ever before. So it was a transition that he had to make. And one of the signs of successful leadership and successful, I think, life behavior, not just in politics, is flexibility, is knowing when to go forward and be bold and when to come step back and say, I may not agree with all of these policy positions, but I see the future. And I see an opportunity for the Republicans to take the Senate back. So I'm going to mold my preferences to these emerging future trends. So in 1981, in fact, Ronald Reagan had won election as president in a big victory. And 18 freshman senators were elected. 18 freshman senators. 
They have a lot of, um, I mean, that's a big incoming freshman class, one of the biggest in the 20th century, 16 of whom were Republicans. 16 were Republicans. But as I said, these Republicans were not the same kind of Republicans that Howard Baker was used to leading. They were sort of a newfangled, they were a little slicker, they ran a much more ideological campaign, they wanted to accomplish Ronald Reagan's agenda. And along with that fiscal agenda and foreign policy agenda came a social agenda. Prayer in school, ending busing, ending enforced desegregation, and rolling back Roe v. Wade. In other words, banning abortion. A constitutional ban on abortion was one of their planks. So this was a challenge for Senator Baker in the highest, to the highest extent. How is he going to actually connect with this newer generation of incoming senators? And how is he going to persuade them not to abuse senators' rights to go to the floor and talk and offer amendments and, and be distracting? How is he going to build cohesion in this majority party? So what he did, I think, which was so clever, was he basically worked not only in the Senate but with the White House and persuaded Reagan and Reagan's people to stick with economic issues. Um, I don't know if you're going to believe this being of your generation, but interest rates were between 12 and 16% in 1981. That was great if you had a certificate of deposit, which is a CD, you earned a lot of interest, but it was abysmal for anyone starting a business, getting a loan, or buying a house or a car. It was horrible. The economy was really bad shape. So Baker said, focus on the economy, the economy, the economy. Where you think Bill Clinton got the economy stupid message? It's from Howard Baker telling the White House, don't go off the track. And if Ronald Reagan could stay on message, then a lot of these conservative senators that had just come from the Senate would stay on message too. So in negotiating with the White House to keep the agenda that he was responsible for enacting close to the heart of economic issues, he avoided some of the conflict that was inevitable in his own caucus in the Senate. Again, a very, very clever move. He didn't just roll over. He didn't just say, okay, we're going to do whatever you want. But he did say the things that we can pass that will focus on the economy, you know, get the interest rates down, uh, cut taxes, these are things Republicans do, and these are things that I can bring to you. I can bring that success to you. So it was a way of consolidating the unity of the party. And once a party gets used to sticking together and winning on votes, they tend to like to stick together more frequently and win more frequently. The other thing that he had to make sure to do was limit democratic obstruction. And this is where I think um, things start to change a little bit for Howard Baker. Uh, in 1981, many Democrats, especially the Blue Dogs, the conservative Southern Democrats in the House and the Senate, liked Ronald Reagan. They were in favor of a lot of these measures. It wasn't that difficult to get these things through. There wasn't that much obstruction. But in 19, late 1981 and 1982, things start to change in the Senate. And I think, especially for Howard Baker's way of governing, you'll think about this. Um, when you think about what was happening politically in the country, Republicans were starting to see that they could maybe one day become a national majority party. They were not yet a national majority party. But what they had to do was mobilize whatever advantages they had. And conservative social issues and the conservative Christian right was a big advantage for the Republicans. So starting in late 1981, Senator Helms of North Carolina started offering amendments on the floor on these kinds of issues. And this started to cause some problems for Howard Baker. He managed to defeat them, but it diluted the message of unity and it diluted the message of the Republican Party. So, for example, I counted for this research uh, how many cloture motions, which are anti-filibuster motions, and tabling motions, which is when the majority leader tables an amendment he doesn't want people to have to vote on and he doesn't want it to pass. In 1981, Howard Baker offered one cloture motion against a Republican, Jesse Helms, and offered five tabling motions, two against Republicans, three against Democratic-sponsored initiatives. And one sign of a majority leader's difficulty in governing his own party is how much he uses procedure against his own party. So by 1982, he, um, Senator ha Majority Leader Baker had filed 11 cloture motions, 10 against Republican amendments or bills, not bills, amendments, and only one against a Democrat. He had filed 17 tabling motions, 7 Republican, and 10 Democrat. So that was proving to be a very difficult year, 1982, for Howard Baker. 
Things were not picking up in the economy as well as people wanted. The Republicans were floundering a little bit. And Social Security was threatened with disaster and failure. So there had to be a lot of legislative work to be done. And keeping this coalition together became much, much more difficult for Senator Baker. Part of the ability to use persuasion is that your audience listens to you, that they feel they have an interest in going with your leadership. These new senators were much harder to persuade about that than the older generation. So when you think about the partisanship in 2010, it really started, it really started, I think, before Bork in the early 80s when you had an opportunity to articulate a very different approach to government, a um, very different approach to government. Somebody lie. It's all right. Um, that happens in class all the time, so I can plow right through. In 1983, just to give you an example, Senator Baker uh, filed nine, nine cloture motions, but this time um, it was against two Republicans, two Democrats, and five co-sponsored amendments by Republicans and Democrats. So not only does his own party start to rebel against him, now he's, he's getting trouble from coalitions of Republicans and Democrats. Senator Byrd is the... Um, minority leader at the time. In 1984, he had to file 14 cloture motions, uh, one against Republicans, six against Republican Democratic Coalition, and eight Democrats, and 15 tabling motions, mostly against Democrats. Things got tougher. So Senator Baker, who was not someone who loved procedure in a heavy-handed way, found himself using the kinds of prerogatives that, that leadership always have in the Senate, which Harry Reid uses all the time now, but he found himself using that not just against the Democrats, against his own party as the Republican Party was experiencing some very big transformational growing pains. And I think it's really important to recognize that he did not use it as first resort, he used it as last resort. I want to talk about um, a little bit of the managerial challenges that Senator Baker faced, as well as the political challenges. Um, and I want to talk about uh, television in the Senate. So managerial challenges. Senator Baker, all the while he's negotiating the political landscape, has to figure out how to make the Senate run and run better. And so what he does is he, Senator Byrd had been the majority leader. He took over for Byrd. He said, we're going to make the Senate more efficient and more predictable. We're going to have a schedule. We're gonna, I'm going to consult with committee chairs every week, and I'm going to ask, what is it that you have on the docket? Is there something that needs to be brought up? When do you see the bill coming out of committee? So I can tell senators when they have to be here and when it's likely that they can go home or they can do something else. So I think it was important for Senator Baker as a majority leader to show his colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, he was concerned about their time. As campaigns started to get more technical, more television involved, more expensive, senators needed to raise money. They needed to be off the floor. You can't raise money when you're on the floor sitting at your desk. You need to be off the floor. So fundraising and campaign pressures start to hit the Senate, in addition to the pressures to travel home. In those days, they traveled home more frequently. or well, not more frequently, but they traveled home a lot. So he took steps to say, this is the schedule, and unless some act of nature or act of God happens, we will stick to our schedule. We will not be in as long as, as we used to be. There will be fewer late-night sessions, although he did, by the way, at one time in four years, instruct the presence of absent senators by arresting them. Do you know that the majority leader can do this? Byrd did it a couple of times. He had no compunction about using it. Byrd uh, Baker was much more circumspect. You can actually instruct the sergeant of arms to arrest absent senators. And that, he did that once. It means basically going to their office or their hideaway, these offices they used to have in the Capitol, um, and pulling them out of the office and saying, come to the floor, we have a vote. Because if you don't have a quorum, you can't vote. So if you wanted to block something but not actually filibuster it, you could just stay off the floor. And so Baker just did that, but only once. He eliminated the practice of stacked votes. Stacked votes are when senators complain they don't want to have to come to the floor and vote for 20 minutes and then leave and come back and leave and come back. By the way, the distance is not that far. They could walk outside, it's a lovely view, or they could take the subway, um, but they complained about it. So it used to be that they stacked the votes, one after the other after the other. He eliminated that practice so that you only had votes on the bill somewhat near when the end of debate came. Why is that important? For accountability reasons, it's very important. Trying to figure out how your member voted when you're sifting through 10 votes or 8 votes is very difficult. But 2 votes is much more easy to identify. So it becomes a liability, but also a strength for the Senate that the votes were not stacked anymore. 
He not only managed committee referrals, he managed turf wars. So he had two, particularly, um, and you didn't really talk about this, but the Finance Committee and the, what's called the Labor and Human Resources Committee always fought, always. Ever since the uh, 1960s, when a lot of programs like Medicaid and Medicare were created, there's a lot of cross-jurisdictional territory. And Kennedy, when he became chair of the um, Labor and Human Resources Committee and then ranking member, and Dole in particular, who was chairman of the Finance Committee, they really fought over territory. They wanted, they wanted to make changes in all these programs. They wanted their committees to be at the head of the, of the game. And even when the Republicans took over Labor and Human Resources, it still was highly problematic. So Baker would have to sit down with them and say, you're getting this piece and you're getting this piece, or it's going to your committee first and then your committee, and settle this problem. It was a problem that plagued, I would say, the Senate all throughout the 1980s, partially because Senator Kennedy was very aggressive about taking any kind of piece of territory that he thought he could and um, controlling the changes in policy. So I think that... Um, I think that is a really important part of management, is figuring out who the key players are and who, really, who you have to count on and who you have to negotiate with on a constant basis. Because power shifts, influence shifts. It's not as if the same players are always running the game at any given point in time. And Baker showed a remarkability to sort of sense who was becoming more powerful and more influential on the Republican side and the Democratic side to help negotiate uh, running the Senate. Another very important thing that Howard Baker and um, Senator Byrd did, starting in 1983, when I described how the Senate was getting a little bit more unruly, as one journalist put it, um, they agreed to limit the use of holds. Now, hold, as Steve Roberts described, is when some a senator, it used to be, now they have a different technology, but it used to be there was a hotline you know, like the movies where there's a red phone for a nuclear war, there was a hotline phone that usually rang in every Senate office. It was either a line or an actual separate phone, and it said, we're about to do the following bills. If you have an objection, call us. And you'd call the cloakroom. The cloakroom is an old expression for where senators used to place their cloaks, but it's an off antechamber where you can leave the floor of the Senate and hang out with your fellow colleagues. They don't hang out there much anymore, but they used to. You'd call the cloakroom and say, don't let this bill come to the floor. I have an objection. But the objection would only be respected for 24 hours. If you didn't get to the floor within 24 hours and state your objection, they no longer respected the hold. But senators were abusing the hold starting in 1982 and 1983. In particular, they'd do two different things. One is they'd call every day. I have an objection. I have an objection every day. They wouldn't come to the floor and filibuster, but they'd just be the same senator holding the bill. Well, the leadership figured this out and said, you don't get to keep this bill in delaying forever. We're not going to give you this option. It's not a Senate rule. It's not a Senate rule. They do not have to ever respect this hold. What it is is a warning shot fired by a senator saying, if you don't hold up the bill, I'm going to come to the floor and I'm going to stand there and delay the Senate business indefinitely and obstruct. And that's going to be bad publicity for you and it's going to kill your scheduling. So it was a way of signaling some opposition. And usually leadership tried to work it out before things got too bad. But over time, people felt insistent that they wanted to block a bill completely. So what they did was, instead of um, calling every day and, make, and the leadership would say, we know it's you, we're not going to give you the uh, hold, they'd do what's called a rotating hold. So what they'd say is, let's say there were five senators who didn't want a bill to come to the floor, you know, one would get Monday, the next would get Tuesday, the next would get Wednesday, and each senator would call up and say, I object, on different days of the week. And then they'd start all over again the next week, called a rotating hold. So Byrd and Baker said, we're not stupid. We understand what you're doing, and we don't like it, so we're going to limit this practice. If you have an objection, you let us know. We're going to try to accommodate you. But if, if, you don't, uh, if we don't sense accommodation, we're not keeping the bill off the floor. You want to come and filibuster it? Come and filibuster it. So here's my really big pet peeve with the current leadership of the Senate. Um, and I've fought this way since George Mitchell ran the Senate. Um, there's no reason in the world you should respect this hold. It's not a right. It's not a right. If senators want to block Senate business, and Senator Tom Coburn is famous for doing this. He's from Oklahoma. By the way, Howard Metzenbaum, a liberal Democrat from Ohio, was equally famous at doing this in the 1970s and 1980s. You come to the floor, and you get recognized, and you talk. Like Strom Thurmond talked, like Byrd talked. You talk and talk and talk and talk. It's tiring, 
I, I mean, I know I could talk forever, but it still gets tiring. Stand there and talk. And if you want to sit down, you can't. If you want to yield the floor, it's only for a question. You can't make two speeches. It's a whole complicated scenario. Make them filibuster. It's not that filibusters have gone up, really. I mean, everything gets filibustered. It doesn't. It's magical. Name one filibuster by one Republican senator in the last two years where you saw them, you know, constantly on the evening news and you saw them ever. Give me one. You can't. Leadership means being tough. Even if you're not elected leader again, you make senators filibuster. And the reason the leadership started a long, si long time ago with George Mitchell not enforcing the filibuster is they didn't want senators to be mad at them and then not vote for them for a majority leader or minority leader again. In other words, senators gave them such a hard time, listen, we're busy, we can't afford to actually filibuster. So it was strategic in the sense that if you make everybody come to the floor, it really bogs the Senate down. Plus, there are debates that you don't want to engage in on the floor in public that are bad politically for you as a party. So you don't always want to have that conversation in public. But the idea that nobody is ever forced to come and actually filibuster is a failure of leadership. And it's not just because they don't like each other or they disagree. It's because they're failing to lead. Harry Reid has chosen other kinds of manipulations of the rules. Again, I think Howard Baker would never have allowed or done what Harry Reid does. He really violates the principle of the Senate. He closes off debate, literally. You can't offer amendments. He uses that right of first recognition not only to fill the tree, but engage in lots of other um, parliamentary maneuvers, even on what's called the motion to proceed to a bill. Even getting to a bill has become more complicated. It really makes it so that senators cannot offer amendments the way they used to. And why is that a fundamental problem? Because the Senate is a representative body. You may not like somebody's amendment, but they represent their state or their political ideology. They have a right to offer amendments to legislation. This is the legislative process. Democrats who ran the Senate as a majority party don't have the right to say it's our way or the highway. If you want to live that way, go to the House of Representatives. That's the way they run things. The founders did not specify any internal rules for the Senate. None. None of this is in the Constitution, with one important exception. The staggering of classes of elections. In other words, no more, this year was 37, but typically no more than 33 or 34 senators or Senate seats are up for re-election in any given election year. What that does is the majority of the Senate is not up for re-election together. So they have time. They have six years to do what they have to do. They can deliberate. They can take their time. They can stall. They can do whatever they have to do. They have the time. And they are not intrinsically connected to the House. The House is up every two years no matter what. The Senate, the majority, is not. They separated the electoral incentives of House and Senate members for a reason. So when you approach governing the Senate as if it's the House to accomplish your party's agenda, you are diluting the power of the Senate. Because there will be a time when one state, and I'll tell you the irony of this in a second, one state has an issue so important to them, they need to filibuster. And that's representation. And that is what the founders wanted in some ways for the Senate, a place where even if there's one person who disagrees, they bring an issue to light. I'm going to tell you two different stories about this. And uh, you can chime in because you'll probably have something to say about Carol Mosley Braun. Um, so in, uh, in, in 1993, or 1993 or 94, there was a very simple measure on the floor brought, brought to the floor by Joe Biden, who was chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and his ranking member, Strom Thurmond, who had previously been chair of the committee, to reauthorize the charter of the Daughters of the American Confederacy. Now, I'm in Tennessee, which has a fascinating pre- and post-Civil War history, um, but this was very important to the Daughters of the American Confederacy. They needed their federal charter. They'd been federally chartered forever. They wanted this charter. So Thurman said this is a great, because um, it was a sponsoring chapter in South Carolina, so he was from South Carolina. So Biden says, fine, no problem. They bring it to the floor. They, uh, they offer it. It goes right through by, by uh, a vote. And they vote. And then typically in the Senate, once you vote, um, the, the party that favors or the majority leader typically says, I move to reconsider the vote. And then the minority leader says, I move to table that. And so the vote is closed essentially. In between, literally in between, the motion to reconsider and the motion to table, it must have been not even a minute, minute and a half, 
Carol Mosley Braun, an African-American female senator who had been newly elected from Illinois, jumps up, literally out of her seat, and says, Mr. President, I'd like the floor. And she gets the floor. They haven't actually tabled the vote. She gets the floor and she says, I just want to say what the Senate did today. Do you know what you've just done? Do you have any idea what this means to African Americans? You haven't debated it. You haven't discussed any of the issues surrounding Confederacy, slavery, the Civil War. Nothing. No consideration. No debate. I object to this. I don't want to do this. I want a full discussion. There's been no discussion. Do you know what this means? And she was chastising the Democratic leadership, the Democratic Party, which benefits from anywhere from 89 to 95 percent of the African American vote. And they had not even had a conversation about it. So it's not just that she was a woman. She was an African-American woman, not just representing Illinois with a significant African-American population, but African-Americans generally. She got up, no chance to offer an amendment of any kind. She, it was just going through the usual business of the Senate. So they have an hour and a half discussion about this, and they re-vote, and it goes down. It's defeated. They reconsidered the vote. And many uh, Democrats changed their votes, including someone named John Kerry of Massachusetts. Changed his vote. They sent it back to committee. The committee had to write a separate report on the nature of the issues involved in the Confederacy and the Civil War, and eventually the charter was approved by voice vote. That's the power of individual Senate representation. It's very important. Another power, which I think is the greatest irony for what Sen Senator Harry Reid is doing as majority leader, which I think really sets a precedent for when the Republicans take the Senate back, what the Republicans can do in the majority. I think this all comes around. The Senate shifts control a fair amount. Harry Reid was elected in 1986 from Nevada. There is a mountain in Nevada. Does anyone know what mountain I'm talking about? The Yucca Mountain. One of the first things Harry Reid ever did in the 100th Congress, 87 to 88, was filibuster a proposal to dump nuclear waste on or in Yucca Mountain. Does anyone know if they actually dump waste in Yucca Mountain today? They do not. He filibustered this every single session for a good 10 to 15 years, I mean, really, forever, really, until he became majority leader. And there was no way you were dumping nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain when he was majority leader. So you know where they're going to put it? New Mexico. I don't know why New Mexico is the loser there and Nevada is the winner. The point is, he used the very powers of filibuster, the powers to object, the powers to delay, the powers to maybe do something that was better for Nevada but not the country, himself, for years and years and years. So if he ever talks about obstruction, it's hard to take him that seriously. I understand the problem, but you can't use the same rule for 15 years um, and then turn around and say, no, 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 not for you, you can't do it. I think Howard Baker would never have engaged in that kind of public hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Either use it and let everyone else use it or don't use it. But you can't have it both ways. Well, apparently you can if you're Harry Reid. Um, Harry Reid went home and ran on protecting Yucca Mountain for many years, too, when he ran for re-election. It was a very big stalwart of his re-election campaigns. And I agree, I have a, a, the same statistic that um, Professor Roberts has, is that in the four years that Howard Baker was majority leader, he... On average, Democrats voted with him 54% of the time. 54% of the time. That's incredible. I mean, that is an incredible statistic. You would never get that today. Never. In the old days, votes that, things that passed the Senate passed with big margins, lots of cooperation, now they're barely, barely passing. But it's a remarkable accomplishment. And understand, there were tides of discontent, tides of change in the Republican Party at this time. But he still managed to win Republican and Democratic votes. So I think that is, once again, a, a great testament to his leadership. Television in the Senate. I think if you point to one thing that Howard Baker saw that other people didn't, most other people in the Senate at the time, it was bringing television to the Senate. The House had approved television in 1978, 1979 with C-SPAN. The Senate was resistant. One of the first things he did was introduce S. Res. 20 to televise the Senate. And the first person up to oppose him was Robert Byrd. 
No, no, no. Well, partly, do you think maybe because Bird wasn't so telegenic? I was wondering why he was so opposed to it. But I think that in the end, he was opposed to it because he felt there would be more grandstanding, more political speeches. It would dilute the character of the Senate. People wouldn't be free to say what they wanted. Meanwhile, there's been the congressional record since about... 1878, 1880, before that there was a Congressional Globe, there's a lot of transcripted remarks. But the thing about the Congressional Record, and I know this because I had to do this, especially since I worked for a man who wasn't always totally coherent, is that you could go to this chamber off the floor as soon as your boss was finished speaking, and the junior people in the office got this task, and you would correct the record. And what the reason you did this was, before the internet, before email, before all this other stuff that you guys have, there was this physical written record. It was typeset. And that's where you knew what your senators had said. That's what you knew what they were talking about. So if you had television, that meant that if you said something on the floor, it had to match what you said on television. The problem for the Senate was frequently they went off the cuff quite a bit or they got into a fight with somebody or it wasn't so coherent and brilliant. Well, you could go to the congressional record and change it. Not too much, but change it enough to make it nice and smooth. Because then you know what you did with it? You printed it up and you sent it in an envelope to your constituents to tell them that you were fighting on their behalf. It was a fabulous campaign tool to send out the record. The problem was once television came, you couldn't do that anymore. And I was doing it once on the immigration bill, actually. It was really late at night. It was like 12.30 in October in 86. And it was, I was trying to fix what he had said about immigration. He had given an entire history of immigration policy in the United States, Senator Moynihan. So it was a long correct. And, and the guy who was running the record said to me, now, now, don't, don't be going changing Moynihan's words too much. The man's an interesting guy. And I said, all right, I'll just be really careful. I'll just make it coherent. Um, you can't do that anymore. I mean, there were all sorts of ways that you would think, you never think about, about the way senators crafted their persona and, and, and image to their constituents in written word and public word that would be upset by television. Um, frequently, you could insert a statement in the record on a debate, and you, you wouldn't know the senator wasn't there to give the remarks. It would just go in as if he was standing there. It was great. It was really a great tool. Then all of a sudden, the evil television came, and they put a black dot next to the remarks. And it said, black dot indicates they weren't there. So then senators went to the floor and said, I ask that my, a statement be inserted. This is what I would have said if I were here. So there were real concerns that you wouldn't have the flexibility that you used to have when television came. So Byrd got together with this guy, Russell Long. He was a bit of a cranky guy, longtime senator from Louisiana. And he was chairman of the Finance Committee. His ranking member at that time, and they obstructed. That was the one cloture motion that I mentioned Bird um, passed, Bird invoked, was uh, against, no, the one was against Helms, the next year it was against Bird and Long, and some of those Republican Democratic coalition cloture motions were against Bird and Long. So for four years, Senator Baker dutifully tries, works hard to try to get television. He said, listen, it's democracy. It's technology. It, the more people see what we do, the more support they will have for the institution, unlike what I think Professor Roberts thinks, and the more they will feel connected to their senator, represented, empowered. So this is just a really good idea. We want to be ahead of the curve. No, 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 no. He got no, no, no. So he finally leaves the Senate as majority leader, and he retires from the Senate in 1984, and he leaves not having accomplished this goal that he really wanted. Lo and behold, 1985 and 86 come along. Senator Dole wins the battle to succeed Senator Baker as the Republican leader. Senator Byrd is the minority leader. And what does Byrd decide? Well, gee, the House of Representatives is getting a lot of television coverage. They seem to be featured on the evening news quite a bit. Why? Because the evening news could show a vote with real people, not just the landscape. A real vote where real people were voting. So this meant the House was getting quite a bit more national coverage than the Senate. And Byrd loves the Senate. And he wanted, the late Senator Byrd, he thought the Senate's getting eclipsed. We are the upper chamber. We're more important. We should be getting television coverage. Well, newsflash, you can't get television coverage if you don't have television in the Senate. So he gets together with Dole and says, the time has come. Let's do it. So he tries to persuade some portion of the party. They do a contingent provisional television of the Senate starting in about May or June of 86 and goes through end of July, early August. 
And it seems that the world didn't change, the sky didn't fall, and senators seemed to manage fine, so they adopted television in the Senate. It took a lot longer than anybody might have expected. Did it change the nature of Senate deliberations? Of course. I mean, in some ways, in the old days, a Republican could go over to a Democrat and put their arm around them or talk to them and look like they were negotiating, but not now when the Senate's televised. So there are ways in which television really reduces the probability of cooperation across the aisle. It increases the probability of speech making in a sort of more superficial, play to the audience kind of way. But as I said, not as much as you would think, because senators always use the technique. Even, by the way, let me tell you, in the late 19th century, they did the same thing. They went to the floor and they made speeches, and then they'd send these speeches out to newspapers and to constituents. So speaking on the floor was always a bit of grandstanding. It wasn't as if it changed it dramatically. It did change, in some ways, the kind of senator who you elect. There's a little more pressure on looking the part than there used to be because of the U.S. Senate. And in the majority leader race, some believe that after Senator Byrd served from 1987 and 88 as majority leader, he was not telegenic, wasn't good on TV. And they chose George Mitchell, who had made his reputation in the Iran-Contra hearings, who they believe was, was better on TV. I don't think Howard Baker would have suffered in the least bit. I think if there was television, he was, was great on TV. He had all sorts of experience, even starting with Watergate on television. He was good on television. So I think it wouldn't have been a problem for him as leader. So I think the, that was a, an amazing amount of foresight. And I think that he recognized trends. He recognized political trends. He recognized trends in media coverage. OK. So here's my, uh, my wish list for Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell. What can they learn from Howard Baker? Um, first, tone down the partisan rhetoric. I think I completely agree with Professor Roberts. This is a leadership question. You don't have to go and slam your colleague. You don't have to slam people personally. You don't have to win your battle in that way. People have won battles in the United States Congress for 200 years. They've been vitriolic at times, but they don't have to be as vitriolic as they've been. So I think the, the long-term success for Senate leadership and, and the Senate would be to tone down the partisan rhetoric. Second, structurally, if you devolved more power back to the committee chairs. This is something Howard Baker recognized was a good, efficient managerial style. If you take some of these battles down to the committee level, they're less public and less intense. You can televise committee hearings, but you don't have to. I mean, you can request it, but you don't have to. So that means that committee people can work out some deals and then come to the floor, which would increase cooperation. The consolidation of party power in the House, particularly over committees, has bled into the Senate. The Senate now tries to control lots of things that the committees are doing, and committee autonomy has been very much reduced. That makes all the conflict come to the Senate floor. It makes running the Senate much more difficult. Put people in committee leadership positions you trust and trust them to make policy. You may win or lose, but devolving more committee power back to the chairs and ranking members, I think, would make this possibility of maybe someday cooperation a reality. Um, the respect the no compete clause. So here's where I differ a little bit, Professor Roberts. I, I, do, I do think that there's always been a tradition of not campaigning against your colleagues, but typically it's in your own state. So what they do is they don't campaign directly. You know, Moynihan did not campaign directly against D'Amato, but he would go to fundraisers for people running against D'Amato. You know, but he would never say anything bad about D'Amato. He'd say, oh, that fellow is great, you know, the Democratic candidate, but nothing really major. That has changed a little bit, but within state, it hasn't changed that much because you've got to work with these people. On the second hand, across the country, it's changed quite a bit. Senators will go to net rallies and try to rally their troops. One senator did not do this in a particular state this year. Do you know who? McConnell. McConnell, unlike Frist, I know I'm in Frist country, so I'm going to be careful here. Um, but, but Senator Frist, by going to South Dakota and campaigning actively in, in the territory of his colleague, was something that was stunning to me. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I've been looking at the Senate for a long time, and I've seen a lot of things. My friend Curtis Kelly, the person I mentioned before, called me and said, do you know where um, Bill Frist is today? And I said, where? South Dakota campaigning against Daschle. There had been an implicit and explicit agreement between majority and minority leaders since they were in, in, invented in the 1920s. You don't go and campaign against the leader. 
No, period. You don't do it. To my knowledge, Frist was the first one to do it in, in 60 years. And it really broke the fabric. It really said, have you no respect for this institution? How could you go there? You can host fundraisers, but going there and campaigning on behalf of John Thune, who subsequently won against Senator Daschle. So I don't care if you hate the guy. You don't go as majority leader or minority leader because it sets an incredibly bad precedent for future cooperation. But Mitch McConnell, in a little tiny blurb, was reported he went all over the country. You know where he didn't go? Nevada. He did not go to Nevada to campaign against Harry Reid. He may have said, and he didn't say much about Sharon Engel because she wasn't an establishment candidate. He raised money. He said, I want the Senate back. He thinks Obama should be a one-term president. He did not go to Nevada. And someone asked him, why aren't you going to Nevada? He said, I'm not doing that. That's something we don't do. I'm not campaigning in Nevada against Harry Reid. So if, if that's a glimmer of hope we want to take, that there's possible, possible potential for the Senate to reverse itself and become a more civil and more collegial body, it's a small kernel, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to, I'm going to go with it. Um, and the last thing is one thing I would I'd really hope that no matter who's president, that the, the prerogative of the Senate, the role of the Senate in a separation of power system, both a bicameral legislature against the House, which will obviously be more pronounced now, but even within the separation of power system with the three branches, that the Senate's powers are protected and preserved. That no matter how important party gets, the Senate has a unique role in the American democratic system, and it needs to be preserved. So if the president's overreaching, Whatever party they are, the Senate has to figure out a way to say you're overreaching. Because if the Senate's powers are not preserved in the system, then I think there isn't any stopgap. There's no stopgap measure, I think, to really prevent political parties from taking over everything to the extent where representation of something that's not party line or, or geographic in nature is at all possible. So I'm going to finish there and then ask if anybody has any questions. <coughs> any questions? No? Any discussion? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Since you're such an expert in Senate procedure, and I think we agree strongly about the nature of leadership, and I, it's an interesting point about, um, uh, about Senator McConnell because he is such a fierce partisan, but, and as you point out, that, that moment when Frist campaigned against Daschle was a seminal moment because it, it really did help poison. It was one of a whole series of escalating uh, events um, that helped lead to this poisonous feeling today. Are there other changes in the procedures that you think could help? What about the reducing the, for instance, the reducing the, the, the number of votes needed for a filibuster? That's oh, one yeah. thing that is raised. Um, uh, you mentioned the holds. Um, uh, are there other, are I, I mentioned redistricting in the House. Are there other things you see that could be done apart from, you know, a, a change of heart or a change of mind structural things that could be done to encourage what I think we both think is a very important quality that Senator Baker reflected and has been lost. Um, I, I think that one of the things that, uh, that you suggested, is, uh, there's different things. There's sort of practice of how you schedule legislation. In other words, when I worked there, you, did, you, had, you went in session on Monday at noon, but there were no votes till Tuesday morning, but there were votes on Friday. So they reserve the right for those votes. So I think scheduling is really important. Making them be there together more, I think, rather than less, is very important. Also, the, there's a lot of controversy over now. Steve Smith is really on this, a scholar, about the motion to proceed, which is a non-debatable motion. But you can object because you ask unanimous consent. That's unanimous. If somebody objects, you can't proceed to legislation. But only the majority leader can make a motion to proceed. So it really... What you have to think about is, is that actually a rule you want to keep intact? Maybe you want to make the motion to proceed debatable. And here's why. You couple it with enforcing the filibuster. So you make the motion to proceed debatable some limited time. So you say, you say to yourself, 
we want to make the motion to proceed deb debatable, and then we also want to uh, require that no holds will be observed here. If you want to filibuster, you have to come to the floor and filibuster. That would at least get a much more substantive dialogue going on a bill sooner and put it front in, in the public eye. So if there's a measure that has to get through and it's being objected to, and that's an inside the beltway kind of objection and public has no way of knowing, if you make the motion to proceed debatable, it will delay things. There's no question about that. But it brings the debate to the floor immediately and it forces people to filibuster. But that couples with forcing people to filibuster. I don't think you should drop the number. I think what's really important is the number 60 seems somewhat arbitrary. The number 67 was the original number in 1917 when cloture was first adopted, but it was a symbolic number. Nobody thought anyone was getting 67 votes to shut down debate. It was a very difficult number to get. It really was like, well, we're going we're gonna to recognize that debate has to close at some point because we're getting Woodrow Wilson's running around the country as president slamming the Senate, so we're going to do something about it. But it really was symbolic. 60 is more practical. There's no, if you change it to less than 60, you might as well just have 51, right? I mean, just have a simple majority. But if you do that, you make the Senate a majority-run institution just like the House. And I think when you do that, you really limit the potential for different coalitions to form in the Senate that could be based on geography or one state that's getting something bad happening to them to really make any strong objection, to win any fight. You can't do it. And I think it would only consolidate partisanship. So I'm not sure about that. I think that the idea of changing what you can filibuster on is dangerous territory. It's very dangerous territory. So I, I don't think it's intractable, but I think they may decide that for uh, you can actually, um, they've made decisions about what's not filibuster before. Reconciliation is not filibusterable. You can't fil and you can't filibuster the debt ceiling. So I think there are pieces of legislation that you can't filibuster. So they may extend that to executive nominations, Supreme Court, justices. They may decide the time has come to do that. But if you are political and you've got a 53-47 on a good day of the amendments are cooperating with you majority, and you think that could flip, why would you ever change the filibuster? Why would you ever limit it? I think it has to be a deal by McConnell and Reid, which probably won't happen, that says enough of this fake filibuster. We want real filibustering. And I think that would diminish filibustering overnight. I do. I think it simply wouldn't happen nearly as much. But the other rules changes, I think structurally, the Congress um, is a bit outdated. I think the structure of the Congress that the Federalists put up is outdated. I think House members should have three, to three years as their term, not two. I think it gives them a little bit more flexibility. It gets them a little bit more time. And I think um, the districting process is a nightmare right now because you, have you will have between 700 and 750,000 people in a congressional district in 2012. We had 30,000 when we first started this country. It's 65 people in the House with 30,000. You can't know, I mean, Rhode Island has less than a million people as a state. You can't know the people of your district with between 700 and 750,000 people, which means party will always be important because it's a signal to the voters of what you're going to do. They never see you. They don't know you. They haven't met you most of the time. So the only thing you have to go on are television commercials or web campaigns and your party affiliation. The bigger the district. So let's make, let's increase the size of the house. The size of the House is not constitutionally limited. It's a law. It was a law passed in 1929 to cap the House at 435. The Russian Duma is 600. The, um, the British Parliament is combined 1,100 people. The Indian Parliament is 900 people. There's no reason in the world you can build a stadium that holds 70,000 people. You can't build a chamber that holds more than 435. There really isn't any structural reason. And I think if you increase the size of the House, you break up some of that stranglehold that redistricting has. So it, everyone thinks you have to con change the Constitution to do that. You don't. And I think that's something that should be um, greatly considered by the powers that be. But I don't know if that, that'll be the Tea Party or some other mobilization. But people are going to start to realize they don't even know their congressmen. They're never going to see them. But this idea of local representation is impossible with districts that big. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. What do you mean? So could the senators write legislation for a program that would be implemented by? No, you can't, you can't structure it that way. You can't say, we're the 10 companies and we'll put up the capital for this program. Could you pass a bill that will give us matching funds directly? Well, I think, I mean, in a lot of ways they already do that. So those companies will go meet with key members of the Energy Committee, and they'll go meet with staff members, and they'll say, this is what we're doing. We need, and we're in your, and we're in your state. Can you introduce a bill that will help us? And if we're going to go to other members of the committee and ask them for their support for the bill, push the bill, and this will benefit us. The only thing you're really not supposed to do, um, there's a constitutional provision against any law that directly negatively affects a single individual, like it only affects a single individual. Um, but generally, you, you can do that as long as there's open competition for federal funds. And, but most people try to help factories in their state. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So you need to be concerted in your campaign. You take these 10 companies and you find where they're located, and they go to their representatives and their senators and their staff. And then, they, then interest groups always do this in Washington, successful ones. They build coalitions by coordinating legislative efforts. So while they get a sponsor in the Senate, they're going to lots of other offices on behalf of the bill and saying, will you co-sponsor it, will you support it? So interest groups, they get maligned all the time, but they play a very fundamental role in coordinating support on Capitol Hill for measures. So I think that is something totally doable. It just couldn't be seen to favor a big corporation and not let a little corporation in on whatever federal benefit was available. Right. Well, fairness, I wouldn't say fairness. I'd say equality of opportunity in terms of applying for money. You may rig it so the qualifications really favor one company over another, but theoretically it's open competition. <clears throat> right, so they could, they would simply do what every interest group and corporation does, which is you set up a, co a committee to make dumping illegal as your co umbrella group, and you employ a lot of lobbyists, and they go around, and they see if they can get support. So I just want to leave you with one last thing. I have time for one last thing. It's a completely separate thing, but I want to make you, not that you made us feel bad, Steve, but um, I just want to talk about the power to change politics just for one second in terms of regulation, going a little bit off. And I think Howard Baker would really like this woman if you, if you met her. Uh, this is an example, actually, from this textbook we have coming out. So uh, the woman's name is Kate Haney. Has anyone ever heard of Kate Haney? Has anyone ever flown an airplane lately? Been in an airplane? Ever stuck on a runway? Ever stuck on a runway? Anybody? You must have been, right? She got stuck on a runway with her family in December of 2006. They were going on vacation for Christmas. She was stuck for nine hours at Austin Airport. They wouldn't let her off the plane. There was no food. There was no water. The toilets didn't work. She was so angry, she got off the plane and said, how could it be I live in America and this happened to me? This is about representation and what you have to do. Like, if you want to change what happens in Washington, you have to change yourself. As a voter, you have to expect more from people. So Kate Haney said, I'm so angry, I'm doing something about it. She and her husband mortgaged their house. They put up a website called flyersrights.org, which still exists, and they got 18,000 web signatures of support for an airline passenger's bill of rights. She campaigned to have Senator Barbara Boxer, just as you're suggesting, introduce the bill in the Senate. She had her congressperson introduce it in the House. It actually made it through subsequent iterations, but it didn't get quite enough support. It made it into a bill, and then the bill died. So she was very frustrated. This is 2007, 2008. She builds a fake airplane on the mall. Anyone ever been to Washington, D.C.? A fake airplane in July. It's hot here in July. It's hot there in July. In the middle of the day, and she sends a big 
press release out to all the members of Congress. Come sit in my fake airplane and see what it's like to be trapped. Not that they didn't know. They usually fly, right, if they're not flying private jets. But she calls all the media outlets, Fox, CBS, NBC, everybody, MSNBC. They all come um, to cover. And everyone knows the media coverage. So a number of congressmen and senators come. And they sit in this airplane. And there's no food, there's no water. And she had shipped in porta potties right outside the fake airplane that were very stinky. These guys lasted 10 minutes, maybe 15. They are scurrying out the exit. And as they're leaving, she has people on either side with clipboards and saying, thank you so much for coming. Will you co-sponsor the Passengers' Bill of Rights? <laughs> Every single one did, because the TV camera's right there. She got 314 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives herself. She's a real estate agent and a mom from Northern California. There's 435 members of the House. She got 314. In the Senate, I think she got 57 co-sponsors, including John McCain. And it ultimately didn't pass as legislation, but in May of 2010, the Department of Transportation issued regulations that said you cannot be on the tarmac for more than two hours without food and water, and you cannot be on the tarmac for more than three hours, period, on a domestic flight, or the airline will get fined $27,500 per passenger. The number of delays... The year before, June of 2009, was 66. 66 incidences of people stuck on their tarmac more than three hours. June of, this is May, the issues regulations. June of 2010, two. Two. And United Airlines missed it by five minutes at O'Hare. Three hours and five minutes. The pilot turned around at two minutes and 55, two hours and 55 minutes. Didn't make it back to the gate till three hours and five minutes. Two million dollar fine. Of course, they're completely appealing it. They'll probably never have to pay it. But it's the point. The point is a woman, not, will, not wealthy, not famous, not rich, not Oprah, she decided that her government had to work for her in a better way, and she made it happen. So if you want your government to behave in a different way, if you want partisanship to diminish and you want civility to rise, then it's up to also all of us to demand that of our senators and our House members. And perhaps we can change things just as Kate Hattie did. Thank you very much.